Interrompemos esse podcast para perguntar quem você quer ser? Designer. Engenheira. Pedagoga. Administrador. Quer saber? O Senac EAD é a nota máxima no MEC. Tem cursos de diversas áreas, com conteúdo elaborado por especialistas do mercado e professores mestres e doutores. Ainda tem o Senac Carreiras, conectando estudantes a vagas de emprego em todo o país. Saiba mais em eadsenacbr graduação. You are listening to the new Mutual Audio Network. Welcome home. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Good morning, I'm Jack Ward, and welcome to the world's largest showcase of modern audio theater, The Sonic Society. This is episode 643, and he's my co-host, David Alt. Good morning, Jack, and indeed, everyone, how have you been this week? Well, it's been busy. I, I don't know how many people know this, but I've been slowly getting better from uh, a concussion that I had about a month and a half, two months ago, um, something we've spoken about a mm. bit before, and it's been a slow progression. The worst part is the nausea. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I, I don't really have bad headaches. I don't really have like missing time or, or I'm not nearly so dizzy anymore as I used to be. But it's the, the nausea that happens when I do a lot of focusing for long periods of time. So working with physiotherapists and such, taking small bites out of my schedule and trying 20 minutes of writing, an hour of doing nothing but you know, listening or resting or whatever, and then, you know, 20 minutes of design work and all those kinds of things. And it's slowly been bringing me back. I'm hoping to constantly increase the time frame so that I feel less and less nauseous and more and more like myself. It's frustrating because it's been <laughs> since the end of February that this has happened. Mm. But, um, you know, there's no specific timeline on these kinds of things yeah i think that it's the nausea is definitely the worst thing because everything else you could kind of deal with but nausea is is just something that is there and is ugh, ugh. yeah yeah it yeah. just makes you like feel just crappy all the time <laughs> yes. now i was i was saying to my my physiotherapist i was saying that uh well, you know, I don't eat as much anymore. He's like, no, you need to eat. You need to eat. You need to sleep. You need to rest. These are things that are important. I was like, okay, but it makes for kind of a nice uh, diet. Yeah. So, like you look at food and you go, I don't want to eat that. Who wants to eat that? I feel sick to my stomach. So I hear hoping your health has been good though. Yes. Other than a touch of sunburn, everything is fine. You've got a lot of sun uh, most recently, haven't you? Yes. Uh, thinking back to Easter weekend, we were getting temperatures of 20 degrees, which is... Uh, what sort of the into the seventies wow. for um, those people in America, which is you know for April is really weird. Uh, and the strange thing was that uh, two days after that on Easter Monday it was eight degrees. Wow! So you know a little bit changeable. It changes back and forth. It, well, the thing that concerns, of course, a lot of folks around is with the with the nicer weather will people continue their social distancing a lot of people well exactly this is this was actually one thing that's been brought up by uh, the government and the various police forces across the country of of now that we we've had 3 weeks of this lockdown and it's a nice bank holiday weekend who's going to want to stay in and mm -hmm. stay inside all day yeah. well perhaps we can ourselves enjoy a little diversion from the issues of this week with the feature Arthurian Dark Saga, which is a dark fantasy audio fiction, a show with a unique blend of audiobook and audio drama. Each episode is from the perspective of the protagonists and sometimes the evil they must contend with. We've included a quick five minute introduction to the characters and the prologue to this series. So without further ado, we present Arthurian Dark Saga, and it all begins right here. On the Sonic Society. This piece of audio is, in essence, a reference sheet. A way to acquaint yourself with the main characters of the story. Or, for one of those times when you hear a voice or a name that you can't quite place or remember, you can always refer back to this and match them up accordingly. This will also give you a small bit of history for each character, allowing a bit of insight into their backstory. 
My name is Anvadar. I am a knight of the Argent Order and its current serving icon of war. I, like all others in its service, are trained to seek out and eradicate all forms of black magic, demon worship, and to bring an end to the very fiends themselves. A son of the nation of Kalandor, I was born to a family who tilled the land. A life of farming lay before me, but that was until the hand of fate snatched me from that very existence and left me where I am today. Though I spent much of my youth in Vengard, the Order's temple, I was given the duty of commanding at Attilian's watch, and from there guard over the ancient tomb within the Black Fells. Orin, Orin Bremoth, or or in a veil of glass as I'm known everywhere else but the small mining town I grew up in. I'm a man of the woods, a hunter by trade. Bears, wolves, boars, even foxes and hares. (laughs) And the occasional bonny lass, aye. (laughs) I take contracts all over Arteria, local lords and such. It's a hard life, but it pays well. Well enough to keep the Arteria red flowing, that is for certain. And I suppose I got to see a lot of the land as well. Anything to keep me from Vela Glas, eh? I'm no spring chicken, but I can hold me home with this bow, and of course with these traps. Aye, wherever there's work, I'll be there to see it done. And of course, collect the bounty. My name is Sigmir. I am the son of Brolgen though none but my uncle and auntie know this. Instead, my people, the Venish folk, who in truth would exile me if they knew, instead know only that my mother died bringing me into this world. Kaleen watched over her in the Shadowlands. I live with my auntie Brenna and uncle Gorgsel, who are traders here in Isaac's Hill. Like all of the few Ven that remain, I keep our traditions and worship all of the old gods in hopes one day they will bestow good luck upon my family. As much as I have been raised amongst the Ven, part of me longs to see Balora, the homeland of my father. Agvalen, forgive me for the lies I have spoken, but I tell truth now. I know I do not belong here. Name's Rowan at Laffa of Gilglaws. My family name's been around since Luna and herself walked Aetherin, and at one time, we were held in a similar esteem. Now, we only hold a small farmstead and some vineyards, but there's still enough gold in the coppers so I never have to do much in the way of labour. Still, I've served for my nation, unlike my bloody brother, can't keep his head out of the old library, up all night reading books, he says. Well, whatever makes him happy. But my family has a bit of a history with obsessions. Something deep down is telling me this ain't right. Anyway, I spend most of my time with Semin and the other boys in town, chasing after the barmaids or fishing. Nothing ever really exciting happens here. Little is known of Lafayas the Asarian, other than one day he was unknown in Belgaroth, then the next he had slain many strong and powerful demons in service of Valmaris. His name has since spread amongst the greater and lesser beings of that Neverworld. With his trademark grey lion pelt, a creature from his homeworld, Asarian, and his deadly blade, Yel Kalashan, he is distinct amongst the twisted and brutal denizens here. The grey-skinned warrior appears incapable of speech, though the reason behind this remains unknown. Though... Some secrets are best left untold. Aetherin Dark Saga is a dark fantasy audio drama. It contains themes of violence and is intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised.
Chapter 1 Prologue Shh, shh. Do you hear that? Yeah, I heard it as well. Listen, I didn't come all this way to get scared now. They're just corpses. All dead. They're not gonna hurt you. Besides, it's not far off now. I, I remember. Oi, Aldi. What? Why are we down here? Fuck's sake, Eric. Why are you asking him that again? You know. Don't make me say it again, or I'll leave you down here. It just seems like a lot of trouble for some tatty bit of scrap is all. They're just fucking bones. Hey, Aldi. Look at this. It's got those markings on. Look. They're not markings. They're the family crest. What are you waiting for? Lift it with me then. <sighs> Bring the torch here, you stupid bastard. That's it. That's the fucking scroll. They didn't lie. They didn't lie. By the line, they didn't lie. Hey, let me see. Hey, get your hands off it. Come on, Aldi, don't it's mine. Like that. I found it. So, what? Aldi, listen. It's that noise again. Shh. Yeah, I can hear him. Sounds like someone's coming. Let's get out of here quickly. His footfalls crunched the snow beneath them. The frozen ground, swaddled in its diamond-dusted blanket, cracked, scattering small echoes into the fresh-born sky. This place, with its dead trees, their gnarled and twisted branches seemed to reach out for him like slickened black talons, wet from the new day fog. He had not seen, nor heard a soul for near two weeks now. His last human interaction paying what little remained of his coin for a single night's rest. A room. One night. Of course. As you can see, we do not have many customers. If you would be so kind to follow me, the rooms are upstairs. So, what brings you all the way from southern Arteria? Do not be surprised. You give it away with your accent. That is, if I am not mistaken, of course. I'm heading north. North? What is north of here? You're going the wrong way for Everan Bridge, or Ballora. But I don't think a man of Amgyron would be heading there. I'm from Gilglass. And now, I'm not heading to Ballora. Do I have to pay you extra coin for you to stop asking me questions? Of course not, sir. I... I apologize. Here is your room, sir. Breakfast, if you would like it, is an extra two coppers. Is there anything you would like for supper? To be left alone. Here's your coin. Of course, of course. Well, thank you for your custom. If there is anything you need... There won't be. He struggled on through the drifts using his sword's crimson scabbard as a makeshift walking stick. His face was pink from the cold, with green eyes bloodshot and edged with gathering tears, ravaged by the freezing winds that howled through the black fells. This desolate place had cradled no life for centuries. Even the trees here that broke through the heavy snowfall were dead, petrified by their environment preserved in their final moments for all eternity. Though he knew very little of this place, what knowledge he had garnered from sleepless nights trawling through the long-forgotten tomes of his family's library, was that this place, the Black Fells, held an ancient relic 
an item of power. The very item he had been destined to wield. So it had been foretold in the scroll, a page from the scriptures of Vedarak. The existence of the scroll had been revealed unto him in a dream. A voice spoke to him in the depths of his slumber, revealing who and what he could become. All he need do is follow the voice's instructions. It was in the old graveyard, inside of a sarcophagus, the final resting place of his ancestor, and upon reading the scroll, the location of the key, the lodestone of Inerian, would be revealed unto him. He had read the scroll, away from prying eyes, away from his jealous friends. By candlelight, he unfolded the pages and stared upon its alien writings. He recalled the pain as he wept tears of blood. The voices. So many voices. And they all now spoke to him. Why remember the stars? How much further do I have to go? I'm so tired and weak. I need to rest. I think how strong you have become. How powerful. That's all very weird. It would go fire for the stars. After many hours of drudging on through the snowbanks, he finally found it. It was here. This was the place he had seen in his dreams. The gathering of the trees, the way that the land rose up beyond this slope. Yes. Yes, this was the place. He dropped to his knees and began to dig. His cold numbed hands shoveled the snow out from beneath him. In the midst of his frenzied scurrying, his fingers struck hard upon wood. The noise of his pain-filled shriek lost amongst the howling winds. Tracing the edges with his hands, he came upon the handles, two iron rings affixed into the heavy wooden panels. He rose to his feet, expecting to heave them open, but they parted surprisingly easily and made no noise as they opened. Paying it no heed, Aldwin looked down into the darkness before him. It's way too low. Far now. Crouching at the edge, he groped blindly into a satchel, pushing aside items until he found his target. With a flint now in hand, he used his sword's edge, striking sparks into the gloom below. It was dark down there. So dark, in fact, he could not even glimpse the floor. Ah, old wind, you idiot. Cursing himself for not bringing a lantern, or some form of light source, he stared at the metallic bar which curved out from the tunnel beneath him. It looked like a ladder rung, only made from iron or steel, coated in a thin layer of frost, appearing to be the first of many leading down. An idea came upon him, as a sudden gust of wind whipped up his cloak as if to gain his attention. Using his sword's edge, he cut a strip from the bottom of the expensive garb, tying it off to the top of his crimson scabbard. He spent a few frantic moments striking the flint before the garment finally ignited. With little to no regard for his blade, he left it in the snow. Stepping down, clutching the top ladder rung with one hand, his second holding the torch. He was less than halfway down before the light from the world above faded and the darkness of what lay below engulfed him.
the world he now found himself in felt unnatural. A haze-like blur had fallen over his vision as he stared at his surroundings with frightening curiosity. The very act of walking felt restricted, impeded somehow as if pushing on through some invisible river. At all sides and above, strange hieroglyphic patterns ran the length of this seemingly never-ending corridor. He felt warm, something he had not experienced in weeks and now the weight of his cloak became overwhelmingly uncomfortable. Pulling down the cowl, he untied it from his furs, his bony fingers, grubby and sore, left dirty stains upon the family coat of arms. The memento of home, discarded as if it were nothing but waste, as he shuffled on upon the dusty hallway. The hours seemed like days, as the effort to continue was immense. His fingers trailing the wall, leaving behind a thin line of blood smeared onto the sand-coloured surface. He fell to his knees in exhaustion, angry at himself for his weakness as the tears streamed down his face. But his body could take no more. Aldwin recognised the voices. It was his friends, Sebastian and Eric. A flash of memory overtook him. Yes, his two very dear friends. How he missed them. They had been his closest companions once, but that was before he'd read the scroll. That was before he'd suffocated them in their sleep. His face a blank expression as he watched their eyes go pink and their lips turn blue. The pair overcome by a strength Aldwin had never possessed before, driven by a will that was not his own. He choked and strangled until the kicking stopped. He felt the guilt. It was burnt into his very soul, yet part of him felt he had no choice in the matter. They would have taken the scroll, they would have done the same to him. Yet he could not shake the feeling. That was a lie. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> With the voices of his friends still echoing in his ears, he did as they commanded and opened his eyes slowly. Had he been sleeping? Had he been asleep this whole time, his head and back throbbed with bruising, proving that this was the real reality. He rose up to his feet as quickly as he could, dizzy and unsteady on his footing. He began wiping his mouth, spitting out the dust which had stuck upon his lips as he slumbered on the ground. His breath caught in his throat as he was repulsed by the scene he was now confronted with. Somehow, somehow he had come to find himself within a circular stone room, illuminated by a burning brazier which hung from chains above him, the flames casting light down upon the room, as well as upon the piles of corpses that now encircled him. The bodies, each in different stages of decay, some ancient with crumbling bones, others with yellowy darkening flesh in the midst of putrefaction. The ground he stood upon was a criss-cross pattern of bloodstains, like some macabre artwork. His fists clenched in response, turning his knuckles white as his eyes widened in fear. He reached for a sword that was not there, and then he remembered 
he had left it out in the fells. A singular door in front of him, which looked thick and heavy, studded with iron rivets, appeared to be sealed tight to its brick archway. Was he a prisoner now? What had happened? He remembered climbing down, but he fell. He'd slipped in his footing, he remembered now. He closed his eyes, trembling, as despair took hold. <gasps> Lunarin, mother of the stars, merciful queen, watch over your servant. Uh, you are awake. Your begging falls upon deaf ears, old winner's lover. Hello? I can't... I can't see you. Who's there? How do you know my name? Oh, Aldwin, I know everything about you. By the goddess. Those mewing fairy tales are just fantasy. They won't help you down here. But I, I will. Come, I have what you see. I only wish to give it to you. Oh, what just is it I seek? The Queen, the Lodestone. It is why you came all the way from Kilgars, is it not? Then I'm not a prisoner. The door is not locked. Come. With a sense of relief washing over him, he strode towards the exit, ignoring the pain that racked his upper body. He pulled on the iron ring which served as the door's handle. It moved easily, catching him off guard as it swung inwards, almost weightless upon its silent hinges. Before him lay yet another corridor. This one was different, more akin to the entrance of a mine than a stone hallway the walls of packed dirt seemed to shimmer with a glittering luminosity, allowing him to see the steps which led the way down. Before he descended any further into the bowels of Averin, he paused. A small throbbing in his hand drew his attention. Looking at his fingers, which looked scabbed over and sore, it was then he noticed his cloak was gone. Had he truly dreamt of the unending corridor? With no real answers to be found here, he continued on. Perhaps his new friend would have the truth of it. Passing through several doorways, he now emerged out into a vast chamber. Immense in its scale, his jaw fell open at the mere sight of it. An uncountable amount of bricks made up its walls and ceiling. Each engraved in a language he could not fully make out from this distance nor would he understand, even if he could. A soft blue pulse of light, slow and steady in its sequence, washed over everything inside, including Aldwin. Ahead of him now lay a wide stone walkway. It alone traversed the chamber, leading on and down towards its centre. As he descended, he peered off the edge, below Darkness lingered beyond a thick veil of fog. Should he fall, the drop would be enough to kill him a hundred times over. He stopped dead in his tracks, hesitating. Come, Aldwin. It is but a little further. You need only walk on. Come and take it. It belongs to you. Aldwin merely nodded as he pushed on. He did not stop, even as a weird sensation engulfed him. It was like he had passed through a wall of water, or entered into some new atmosphere that he drove on regardless. He had suffered greatly to get this far. He could not falter now, not when his prize was so close within reach. The steps ended abruptly, cutting off to a sheer drop down into the void below. Beyond Hovering in the air like an iceberg within an invisible ocean, a cube of frosted crystal, the hue of a green sea. 
connected from where he now stood by a strange metalwork bridge of twisted steel rope and stone panels, it floated without foundations. The faces of the cube were each inlaid with strange patterns and symbols, some of which Aldwin recognised, but most he did not. Skulls peered out from its sides, some human, others indiscernible with spiralling ram-like horns and long tusks. Crossing over the bridge, Aldwin stepped atop the cube. There, at its centre, something sparkled with a radiant white light. On his approach, wisp-like orbs circled overhead, twisting down to converge within the radiance. Movement below caught his eye as he tread upon the cube. Curiously, each step he took was matched from below, as if he walked atop a mirror. Though rather than his bootprint as he would have expected, a strange elongated foot showed instead. Here it is, Oldman. The Lone Stone. It's been waiting for you. Reach out. Take hold of the power that you deserve. It's so beautiful. Wonders. Yes. Do you feel its power? <laughs> Lost in a trance-like state, Aldwin did not see the shadowy arm reaching up from beneath him, nor the fact his hand cupped nothing but the air, though his eyes saw differently. In his mind he saw a green stone, impossibly beautiful in its appearance, a white glow of godly light emanating from within. Almost delicately, as if cradling Aldwin, the hand closed around his throat. It squeezed slowly, trapping his windpipe, stopping all flow of air into his lungs. He did not react. He did not struggle. Instead, he was overcome with an ecstasy he had never experienced before, and never would again. With a sudden crack, the claw-like hand snapped Aldwin's neck with a jerk, dropping his limp body as the arm retracted within the cube. A cry like that of a thousand hawks pierced the chamber, though this was not a mournful wail, nor the agonised shriek of pain, but instead the elation of freedom from harsh imprisonment. The hate-filled shout of vengeance from the rot. The pulsing light within the chamber dipped. Then it exploded in a shockwave that rippled through the atmosphere, shaking free centuries of dust and loose bricks in its wake. Aldwin's corpse rose steadily upwards as if raised by unseen hands. The head, unsupported, fell backwards, his mouth agape in a gruesome death mask. From beneath his clothing, blue flames emerged, running the length of his corpse, burning away flesh and hair, dripping hot fat, which hissed as it spattered upon the cube below. Directly beneath, a dark crimson mist swirled, rising upwards. It wrapped around Aldwin's now skinless cadaver, finding entry within his gaping mouth and nostrils. Whatever this creature was, it now stood upright on the cube, a sickening laugh spewing forth from its lipless mouth, as yellow eyes without pupils stared at new limbs in wonder. The burgundy purple of exposed muscle, ligaments and tendons on shore for all to see. Raising and opening a fist before its skinless visage, the once human hand of Aldwin Contorted and stretched, the blunted finger bones now curved and reformed in thick black talons, dripping in an ebony ichor. Mortals, <laughs> truly a work of art. But before it could bask in its triumph, it caught scent of something, 
spinning upon fleshless heels and crouching low into a defensive pose. It was ready, ready to face the coming threat. You are too late, fools. The body is already mine. Anvidar. He held the lantern in his left hand, its undying flame within casting light upon the spiralling steps they now both descended. In his right hand, a short sword, a weapon ideal for such confined spaces. Behind him, his squire followed, matching footfalls upon the stone. Their armour was uniform, a dark purple dye stained their leather studded canvases his eyes as grey as the steel pauldrons he wore. They shone in the candlelight, even amongst the solid band of black ink that ran from behind his skull over a shaven head to finish upon his cheekbone. They had ridden hard to get here in time. Through the tundra that surrounded the outpost of Attilian's watch, on through the ice and rock-strewn valley, struggling on, the snowdrifts and icy gales of the Black Fells. Gather your things, Elias. What's going on, Envidar? The seals are broken, and there has been sightings of a lone wanderer heading north. Do you think it's the necromancer? Not by the innkeeper's accounts, but we must investigate all the same. Come on. Should I get your armor, my Leave icon? Leave it. My garrison will suffice. As you say. Hurry up, Elias. Emerson! My Lord Envidar. I want my horse and another. Saddled and ready to ride out into the fells as soon as possible. My squire is coming with me. My icon you will mount is still and will. She is not fit enough to make the journey. Very well. See to her care. I'll leave the mount to your choosing. Make haste. Time is not on our side. As you say, your will, my icon. The younger man, Elias, his squire, looked to Anvadar with a face filled with worry. Do not fear him, Elias. I will protect you. Besides, you are ready for this. Your skills are proven. Just follow my lead. But the sigils... I need more time to finish them. What if he escapes or... someone else comes? There is no time for that now. The longer this creature inhabits its vessel, the stronger it will become. Why risk letting it gather its strength? Remember, fight smart, not hard. I can smell your weakness, cowards. Come out and face me. Your training ends here, Elias. Holding his lantern out in front of him, Amvidar stepped through the doorway. The chamber, though dark from outside, was illuminated well enough to see within, though by what means he could not say. He placed the device down and continued on. of the weakly god. Come to embrace your death, have you? Save your words, foul one. You face the icon of war. Your petty titles mean little to me, mortal. I will feast upon both your hearts. He placed his hand upon the squire's shoulder, who clenched his mace and shield nervously, breathing deep. You will go forth, a squire and arise a knight of the order. They descended the stairway, arms poised and ready, moving in unison as per their training. Amvadar's eyes widened as the demon before him sprang into the air, leaping an incredible distance, smashing down with a weight its body should not have contained. Its first strike was aimed at Amvadar, who through great effort parried its talon-like hand away this one. 
This one here far surpassed his expectations. A demon this newly revived should not be this powerful. In retaliation, he swung his short sword, but it sailed by, missing the creature's gut narrowly. With a speed he could not have anticipated, it lashed out at Elias, kicking his legs away from underneath him as the squire swung his mace. He fell awkwardly upon the stone, but rose back to his feet, weapon in hand. Amvadar thrust forth with his blade, aiming at its heart, but the demon grabbed his arms, his armour barely stopping the talons from digging into his flesh. Before he could react, it pulled him towards its jagged maw. With teeth dripping with saliva, it bit and snarled as he struggled to fend it off. Anvadar, allowing the movement at the last minute, smashed his head into the demon's own. As a follow-up to his initial strike, Anvadar stabbed hard his short sword, ramming it into the creature's chest cavity, where it remained stuck, the handle sticking out between the ribs. Shrugging off both attacks, it pulled him in close again, returning the headbutt and sending Anvadar to the floor. The sheer power generated buckling the warrior's defences. Stunned, and on the verge of consciousness, he watched as Elias swung his mace, smashing it into the creature's back for a little response. A wild backhand sent his squire flailing onto the stone, this time falling down the steps in a clatter. His shield, which had absorbed most of the strike, smashed to kindling. A powerful grip closed in around his throat, seeking to crush his windpipe through his male gorget. Eyes wide open with surprise as the demon hauled him up, the toes of his dark leather boots scraping the stone as it tightened his grip. The strength contained within this vessel was immense. Anvadar towered over other men, his physique the envy of veteran blacksmiths, yet this fiend lifted him like an infant, choking the life from him in the process. This is the finest it has to offer. And Vidar struggled. He tried to warn him, tried to tell him to run, but the words would not come. His vision was darkening, yet he saw Elias. He could barely move his head, though it would not have stopped a thing. The squire, two hands upon his bludgeon, came to strike, seeking to crush the skull in a hammer blow that might fell an oxen. But instead, skewer-like arms extended out from under the demon's shoulder blades, each tearing through armor, flesh, lungs, and then his heart. Tears welled up at the edges of his eyes as they began to turn pink, the capillaries bursting within as he fought against strangulation. He fought on to clear his mind, forced his thoughts to let go of the anger, the desperation, the need for vengeance, and instead to centre in on his years of training. The focus came upon him in the form of the tenets of his faith. In his mind he drew upon the power granted to him by his patron deity, protector at God, Galador. With all the strength he could muster, he booted the handle which stuck out from the demon's ribs, the sudden attack weakening the grip around his throat. Now. Reaching down and unsheathing his true weapon, the arming sword he had been granted when gaining the title of Icon of War. The blade with which he had bested countless foes. The blade with which he had named Breaker. The blade which he now brought upwards in a cleaving arc, nearly severing the creature's arm off at the elbow. Anvidar, now loose, fell to his knees. He would not remain there long, for like a striking viper, he raised Breaker once again, turning away a blow meant to remove his head from his shoulders. 
The beast came on again, only this time Amvidar was ready. He brought down his sword, slashing out in front of him, causing the demon to step backwards. And as he did so, the icon of war lunged, breaker's tip surging forward. The arming sword struck home, piercing the demon's yellow orb, black gore spurting forth as the eye burst in its horrid jelly. Retracting his blade, Anvidar could see victory within his grasp, and so, booming out his god's name, he charged once again, seeking to end it now with a heavy two-handed blow. But before he could close the gap, the demon was gone, leaping into the air with supernatural agility, bounding up the steps, fleeing towards the doorway. In a state of shock, Amvidar stood and watched as this insidious creature with black fluid pouring from its wounded eye socket and arm tore away its useless dangling limb, discarding it off into the unseen depths below. You are impressive for a mortal. But know this, I am Astaroth, Duke of the Bloodlands and bringer of carnage. What you have faced today is but a mere shadow of my true form. I will destroy your order and burn everything it holds holy. I will annihilate your Grandmaster and spread his entrails upon the God's altar. Your sacred halls will become a charnel house, a sacrificial pit dedicated to the eternal darkness itself, and I will come for you. You will not leave here, foul one. Our sigils will have you bound. You cannot run. Face me and let this end. <laughs> Your magics are nothing to me. And with that, Astaroth was gone, fading into the darkness of the room beyond. Once he was sure that the beast had fled, he made his way quickly over to his fallen squire, rolling his unmoving body up to face him. But it was all too late for Elias. He was long dead. His expression frozen in his dying surprise, dust stuck to him by his own blood with eyes wide and soulless. I'm sorry, Hansel. I failed you. I'm so sorry. Elias, I could not. I could not save you. Forgive me. Galador, take this fallen soul into your halls. Let him drink deep from the horn of eternity. Take your place amongst our brothers and sisters. I swear there will be vengeance for you, my friend. I swear it. And that's this week's show. Please check out the show notes at our website at sonicsociety.org for Arthurian Dark Saga so you know where to continue the tale. Continue the conversation with us on Facebook at Sonic Society or Audio Drama Radio Drama Lovers Groups or at Twitter at Sonic Society or at Astro Tour 2010. That's me. For Jack Ward and myself here at the Sonic Society, please be safe until we see you here next week. A relaxing time and a distant time, folks. Good morning. The Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. 
All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening. This has been an Electric Vicuna production.